Hey there, Stephen Hu from the AJE Journal. Yes, I still have the long hair. And no, I haven't called a barber yet. Welcome to the opening ceremony of the 2020 Eco Congress. This is a brand new event for us. You know, a few months ago, I would never thought I'd be sitting at home today recording this video as I'm speaking to you right now. But a lot has changed since then. There is an ongoing pandemic and folks have to stay at home. Uh, and actually, all in-person tournaments and workshops have been canceled. So it really is a different reality we're facing here. Of course, initially, I was looking forward to Estes Park as well. And when I heard that the Congress was canceled, I was very disappointed, just like the rest of you. But I thought of something. We actually have great potential to make a week of tournaments and events online. Now that we got all these Go servers and platforms, it might be interesting to put together an online Congress for the first time ever in history. This is actually the first occasion, I believe, in 36 years that we're taking everything entirely online, which is very unfortunate for us, of course, but hopefully you'll enjoy this week's event anyway. Now, actually, this year I've taken a different role. Uh, I'm also the Congress deputy now, so <laughs> be ready to ask me lots of questions during the week. I decided to join the team. And after, I should say, about two months of hard work, we're finally excited to present this to all of you here. So hopefully this is something that you'll enjoy. Now, uh, we're really gonna have a lot of fun with this opening ceremony. It took us a long time to put this all together. So we hope that you'll stick around. Uh, it's gonna be about two hours long, I think. So lots of good content coming up. We hope that you'll enjoy it as well as the rest of the week. But first of all, let's talk about how this Congress came to be. You know, it didn't just rise out of thin air. We actually had to go through a lot of group discussions countless meetings on weeknights and on weekends. And, you know, it really takes a huge effort to make this happen. As you can tell right now, it's even hard to put that into words uh, as I speak at the moment. So, of course, we tried to do this the other day. I was talking to my co-Congress director, Audrey Wang. He's also been putting many long hours into this project. So, yeah, here's what happened. Check it out. Right. So tell us about this Congress. I mean, yeah, so I, I would just like to talk to give people a little background of about how this uh, Congress came to life. I think a lot of people would be uh, interested to know. So this all started uh, in May. It's uh, May 12th, I remember. I sent Lisa a message. I was asking her if she would be interested in a virtual 9x9 tournament. And then we had a phone call. Uh, the next day, I think I asked a few people. I asked Insan. I asked some uh, people, organizers in Boston. And I think I got some support from MGA, the Massachusetts Go Association. So I, I, I talked to Lisa, I said, I think I got the, the support from MGA and I think Insan would be interested to give some lectures. So maybe we can do a Go Congress. And that week we had our first meeting. Um, from there, we little by little, we all the pieces came together. Um, I think Stephen, when did you join this? I think it was uh, the end of May. Uh, you know, I was end of May, yeah. So it's like two weeks after we talked yeah. about it. Yeah. At first, it was like we were just thinking about a mini event. It's nothing like crazy, but now we have like all over like nine hundred registered participants. So it becomes a big event. I think it's the largest uh, event, largest Go Congress in history. Yeah. Would you agree that with that? Well, let's hope that all of them show up. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I think this Congress, I, I would just want to say this, it would not be possible uh, without all the volunteers. And I think you and Lisa have put in like huge amount of time and efforts. And I just really want to thank you. Um, I, I feel like between three of us, like maybe just between you and Lisa, you've been working probably like 24 seven, 
because you are in China and Lisa is here and because of the time difference. So you're like always working. It's, it's, it's really a lot of work. And thank you for that. And also like yeah. you are graduating. So you also have a lot of like other work. It's, yeah, it's, I, I just think that you've put in really a lot of effort and, and I really like your, your logo of um, stay six lines apart. <laughs> it's pretty clever. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> well, I hope, it was a good, it was, I hope it was a good laugh, you know? Uh, yeah. It's not meant to be a serious poster. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I have to say that the 12 hour time difference uh, was difficult. Also, uh, obviously, we're operating everything over the internet. And as you know, right now, uh, we are very dependent on that. So sometimes, you know, there does come an occasional disconnection or two, and sometimes that does affect our workflow. So um, I think as much as I enjoy online congresses, I, I really want in-person play to return at some point. Uh, we just don't know when that's going to be. But in the meantime, uh, I obviously recognize that people have been um, experiencing challenges this year. You know, it's not the easiest year uh, by any means. So I just hope that we are putting on a good show this week. You know, it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, the most important thing is hope enjoy so. the Congress. Yeah. yeah, well, hopefully we also do a good job, right? So to not disappoint yeah. you. Audrey, will you be there? I uh, I hear that you're busy this week. Will you be with us? Oh, oh my God, I will be so busy this week. It's uh, the craziest week for work. Um, I don't think I will be there uh, in the morning, but after work, depending on how late I stay at work, I will be there. Okay, well, hopefully... Uh, I mean, like, I will attend my own tournament, <laughs> and I will play in the Perigo tournament, too. All right, well... Thank you uh, for having me here. Yeah, uh, thanks for coming on, and uh, hopefully see you in one of those uh, happy hour games, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, kind of crazy, right? I mean, things just come together randomly like that. So I hope that you'll see Audrey around. Uh, she's going to be busy during the Congress week. But if you do see her around on OGS or any other server, please say hi to her. She's done tremendous work for this Congress, and we thank her for that. But of course, it's not just about the Congress organizers. And first and foremost, we have to thank the American Go Association. Uh, Thanks to their tremendous help, we're actually able to put this event all together. So even though we can't really meet with each other in person this year, the AGA would nevertheless welcome you to this entire Congress, and hopefully it's going to be something enjoyable. So starting off, we're going to have a message of welcome from, of course, no one other than the AGA president himself, Mr. Andy Oaken. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 2020 EGO Congress. This project comes not as the result of long methodical planning, but because people suddenly started to volunteer to do the various necessary tasks before we even had an event for them to be part of. My thanks go out to all of those many volunteers who pitched in to make this happen, and to the AGA staff who've risen to the occasion, led by our uh, Congress coordinator, Lisa Scott, and to all of you for being patient and enthusiastic while we figure out uh, how to live in this uh, altered world we have here. Uh, let's take a moment also to tip our hats to the folks in Colorado who put together a great Congress for us and got robbed at the last minute by circumstances. I'm confident their Congress will be a great success when the coast is clear, uh, but this is the one we have for this year. So have a wonderful time and no Facebooking during your games. Have an excellent Congress. Thanks very much, Andy. I hope that we will. And yeah, hopefully we won't disappoint. Next up, let's welcome the chairperson of the board of directors, as well as our Congress coordinator for a very, very long time. I can't thank her enough for what she does. Lisa Scott. I want to welcome you again to the 2020 EGO Congress. I will thank specific people later. But first, I want to ask you all to please take a second to thank all of our volunteers and their families for the dozens of hours of work that they have put into this event over a very short period of time. 
I also want to thank everyone who registered for the EGO Congress for participating. Most of the events that we are doing this week are brand new, or at least had to be rethought from the ground up to make sure that they worked in an online environment. This year's Congress was supposed to be held in Estes Park, Colorado. Like most decisions made in the past six months, the decision to cancel the Congress was not easy, but ultimately seems to have been the only possible decision. When Audrey started brainstorming ways to hold online events, it seemed like the perfect way to continue a tradition. We never expected the event would come together so well. I also want to thank members of the Estes Park team, specifically Eric Wainwright, who would have directed the 2020 US Go Congress and who is running our nine by nine tournament, and Emil Meng, who was registrar for the Estes Park Congress and is our registrar for this. I want to thank them for switching gears and working tirelessly to help us make this event a reality. I can't tell you how humbled we are by the response this event has received. We have had 942 people register from 52 countries around the world. This roughly doubles the number of people who usually come to Congress and quadruples the number of countries rep represented. We also have a far more equitable range of skill levels among our participants, notably 268 double digit Q players. We welcome all of you and want you to know that you are always welcome at Go events in person or online. We want all players from those who have just learned the rules to those who have played their entire lives to feel welcome, involved, and like they have a right to participate. I also want to take a moment to talk about a more sensitive issue of diversity. As I think the whole world is aware, the last two months have been a time of self-reflection for the United States in regards to race and inequality. Like the rest of the world, the American Go Association has also taken this time to reflect and think about ways that we can do better. For this reason, the AGA Board of Directors has formed a Committee for Diversity and Inclusion, chaired by Samantha Feedy, which is actively seeking new members and already developing programs and outreach to help us become a more inclusive community and to bring more people of color into decision-making positions within the AGA. You can find more information and past eJournal stories on usgo.org. Just click More Go News at the bottom of the homepage. Thank you all, and I'll be speaking with you again in a few minutes to tell you about the events that we'll be hosting this week. Thank you, Lisa. Actually, it's a little bit less than a few minutes because we'll be having right back for the next segment. So, you know, we shot everything at separate times. So um, things might look a little bit different, but, you know, um, it, it's a big project. So bear with us here. But anyway, uh, this is all very important work uh, Lisa is doing. So if you would like to volunteer, uh, please reach out to her. Uh, maybe send her an email. And I'm sure we'll be very happy to include you. But what is this Congress all about? What events are really there? And what can you expect during the week? Now, obviously, maybe you have seen the registration form and the Congress website already. That's all very useful information. But I thought it might be helpful for us to just give you a quick taste of what to expect in the upcoming days. You know, this Congress actually runs from August the 1st to 9th. So it's actually the same as a regular Congress. And even though it's online and there are certain things we cannot do as much. Of course, we'll be missing Crazy Go this year. There's still a lot you can enjoy. So let's welcome back Lisa for our week overview. As Congress coordinator, it is my privilege to give you an overview of the Congress. We will be hosting seven tournaments, each with a little bit different character. You'll hear specifically from each TD in a few minutes, but I'll give you a little overview of the events now. You can also find a complete schedule on our website gocongress.org. First, our premier tournament, the Ego Congress Open, a close cousin of our usual US Open, will, take, will start in a few minutes. This four round event will take place today, Saturday, August 1st, tomorrow, and next Saturday. Dan Ritter and Milan Mladinovic are the lead TDs and they are assisted by Kat Mai and Neil Ritter. This evening, we will also host the nine by nine tournament. This is a round robin tournament. All players will be divided into tables that will hold preliminaries this evening and finals throughout the week. The tournament is directed by Eric Wainwright. 
Throughout the week, during the day in the U.S., we will also be hosting a Blitz tournament. With four days of play, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, and nearly 300 players, there are sure to be thousands of games of Super Speed Go. This tournament is directed by Jan Boli, with assistance from Catherine Shi. On Tuesday and Wednesday nights, we are proud to be able to offer a four-round tournament that is focused on double-digit Q players as well. The double-digit Q tournament reached capacity days ago and has a wait list dozens long. The success of this event tells me that this is a place where more events and outreach will be welcome, and we're glad to see that. The tournament is directed by Bart Lepofsky, with assistance from Andrew Zhang and Kay Lu. Now we arrive at the less tra traditional Go tournaments. We have two Relay Go tournaments, one for youth only and one for everyone. The Youth Relay Go tournament on Wednesday is directed by Devin Fraz, and the Relay Go tournament, open to everyone, although long since at capacity, on Saturday evening, is directed by Audrey Wong, with assistance from William Luff. I will let the TDs explain the details of their events. Our final tournament is the Perigo tournament, which will be held Thursday evening. This two round mini tournament gives people, often male female pairs, the chance to play in a tournament that is both competitive and cooperative, and usually results in a lot of not quite right go, since partners cannot communicate. The tournament is directed by Andrew Zhang with assistance from Kevin Wong. In addition to our tournaments, we will also be hosting a number of other events. These include a number of broadcast events that Chris Garlick will tell you about in a few minutes, as well as just some general social hangouts that Julie Burrell will be hosting tomorrow night and next Sunday. As always, we will also be offering a number of events with professionals. These will be live simuls, game reviews, lectures, as well as commentaries on all of our broadcast events. We are also keeping alive a tradition by hosting the Bob High Memorial Song and Poetry Contest. You can find more information about this contest on our website, gocongress.org. To enter, you can write an original song or parody of a song or a poem about anything Go related. We have many professionals and strong amateur teachers also participating in the Ego Congress this year. They will be offering game reviews, simuls, commentaries, lectures, and also just participating in some of our events as coaches and players. We welcome them very much. Finally, we will be offering merchandise this year as well. Normally, we hand out t-shirts, mugs, tote bags, pins, all of those kinds of things in person at registration. Since we can't do that this year, we're making them available for purchase on our store usgo-stuff.org. Please look at our website in order to purchase some of these things so that you can remember the event. Yep, a pretty great week. Uh, I wish I I wish I could play in some of the tournaments, you know? Uh, but well, first of all, there's a time zone difference for me. And second of all, when you're an organizer like me, Go Congress is not really about playing Go anymore. So yeah, I'm going to have to give the prize to other people this year, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, maybe one... One of the years, I will win some tournament. <laughs> now, of course, uh, we did talk about tournaments. But apart from that, it's not just about playing in tournaments. We have a lot of teaching events as well. You know, every year at the US Go Congress, in person, obviously, we would have a lot of professional Go teachers as well as our top amateur friends who come over to the US Go Congress and enlighten us with their lessons, their lectures, and their simuls. So all that is really wonderful. And even though we cannot do that in person this year, we would like to bring it back. So we've actually got a pretty good team here, I thought. Um, I'm really looking forward to what we can learn from this week's teachings. So without further ado, let's welcome Lisa back again for an introduction of our pros and amateur teachers. I would like to welcome and thank all of our pros and teachers, the wide array of professionals and strong amateur teachers who agreed to work with us to make this event spectacular is astounding. These professionals and teachers were not only willing to work with us, but also proposed new events and approaches that have made the Ego Congress even better. As always, we will introduce our pros in order of rank. Myungwon Kim, 9 Pro, Korea, will be offering simuls and game reviews throughout the week, 
and will offer commentary on board three of the City League Championship on Monday night, as well as commentary for the top board of Relay Go next Saturday. Michael Redmond, 9 Pro, Japan, will join us on Friday night to offer commentary on board one for the City League Championship. Yoon Kim, 8 Pro, Canada, will be offering simuls during the week and will offer commentary on the top boards of the Pergo tournament on Thursday evening. Mingju Jang, 7 Pro, US, will offer game reviews during the week and is also playing in the City League tournament on board one for the Bay Area team. Yulun Yang, 7 Pro, US, will offer small group game reviews during the week. Bio Maeda, 6 Pro, Japan, will offer game reviews with translation by Francis Meyer, 1 Pro, Japan. Gojuan, 5 Pro, Netherlands, will offer public game reviews. Cube players may enter a lottery for these reviews, following the link on our website. Hajin Lee, 4 Pro, retired, US, will join our AI Go roundtable and is also playing in the City League tournament on board two for the Bay Area team. Kathy Lee, 1 Pro, Canada, will offer game reviews during the week. Eric Louis, 1 Pro, US, will serve as Team Relay Go top board coach and will participate in our Twitch Plays Go broadcast. Ryan Lee, 1 Pro, US, will offer lectures, game reviews, and simuls throughout the week and is also playing in the City League tournament on board one for the New York City team. Francis Meyer, 1 Pro, Japan, will offer game reviews with Rio Maeda, 6 Pro, Japan. Insong Huang, 8 Don, France, will offer lectures and will join us on Wednesday night to offer commentary on board two of the City League Championship. Michael Chen, 7 Don, US, will offer game reviews and will serve as Team Relay Go top board coach. Yuan Zhou, 7 Don, US, will offer game reviews both weekends. If you're interested in participating in any of the small group professional events, you can sign up for them for a small fee on our Eventbrite site. You can find the link on our website, gocongress.org, or by running a search for American Go Association on Eventbrite. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, I have to agree with you that it's a pretty good lineup. So I'm really looking forward to how much we can learn from our teachers this week. Do keep in mind that Teachers' times are valuable, so if you do sign up for a simul or a game review, please show up on time and please be respectful of your teachers. And of course, feel free to ask any questions. We welcome players of all ranks, so don't worry about uh, asking anything that might be too simple. One word of advice for simuls, though. Don't die in Gote. So if you die in Sente, that's fine. It's honorable. But if you die in Gote, then it's not so good. So... Uh... <laughs> Try not to do that. But actually, apart from paying for lessons on Eventbrite, you can also earn some of these opportunities by doing well in your tournament. Because we have a lot of prizes thanks to our gracious sponsors who have agreed to offer support this year. So we are very thankful for what they have to offer. And hopefully, you can pick up one of those prizes yourself. So let's hear a bit more from Lisa now about our prizes and our sponsors. I would like to tell you about our prizes and thank our sponsors, which really are two sides of the same coin. First, we are pleased to announce that the top prizes in the Open, 9x9, and Blitz tournaments are individual game reviews from professionals. This is fantastic. We would like to announce that in addition to providing public game reviews, Gojuan has offered to sponsor our Q winners by offering certificates to her Internet Go school as prizes in the open and the double digit Q tournaments. Finally, we are receiving the support of and a number of prizes from AI Sensei, whose founder, Benjamin Teuber, has offered a number of two month subscriptions for us as prizes for the Ego Congress Open, the 9x9, the Blitz, the Youth Relay Go Tournament, the Pergo Tournament, and the Relay Go Tournament. We would like to thank Insong Huang for being one of the early supporters of the Ego Congress. If anyone is looking for more Go over the next two weeks, you can check out his online summer stage. More information is available on gocongress.org. 
We would also like to thank the New York Institute of Go, along with its teachers, Ryan Lee and Stephanie Yen. You can find more information about their YouTube channel and their school on gocongress.org. Thank you especially to the support from all of the platforms that we are using, particularly our Go servers, OGS, KGS, and Pandanet. Thank you also to the video and streaming platforms that we are using, Twitch, YouTube, and Zoom. We would also like to thank both the American Go Association for all the support they have offered to the Ego Congress and the American Go Foundation for the support they consistently provide for youth and educational programs in the US. If you are interested in learning more about these organizations, please visit usgo.org to learn more about the AGA and agfgo.org to learn more about the AGF. You can also donate to both organizations from the front page of gocongress.org. I want to say a last thank you most particularly to our volunteers. I will thank all of you again in the closing ceremony, but I want you to know that whether your support takes place behind or in front of the camera, your work is very much appreciated and this event would not be possible without you. Yep, yep. I'm telling you, by the end of the week, the credits list is going to be pretty long. So anyway, I know that you guys have been asking for tournament information. Lots of you have already signed up. We actually have a record turnout this year, as Lisa has mentioned already. So very excited about that. Now, this is the time of the year where we normally have tournament directors come to the podium and tell us a little bit about their tournaments. We cannot do that this year in person from a podium. So we actually had to go through various Zoom calls to record what they had to say. But that's fine because you'll hear about a longer version of how to walk through the technical aspects on YouTube. There's actually going to be a playlist on the AGA official YouTube channel. That's going to include more details on how to navigate around the servers if you're really new to this whole setup. We recognize that some of you may not be familiar with a particular server or might not be even familiar with playing online. So that's not to worry. Uh, they will walk you through the, all the details. And of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to them. So I know that everyone's been asking questions about the Ego Congress Open, of course. That is actually the largest event of the week. I believe we have about 700 people who sign up. And it looks like it's going to be our largest open tournament ever. So first of all, let's welcome our open TD, Dan Ritter. Hello, everyone. My name is Dan Ritter, and I'm the tournament director for the online US Open. Milan Milanovic and will be my co-TD, and Katmai will be assisting. Nothing can replace the experience of the in-person US Open. For decades, it has been a cornerstone of the US Go community, bringing together hundreds of players from across the United States and around the world. There is a special magic in coming together to share our passion for Go, and it pains me that we can't do that in person this year. But modern problems require modern solutions. And this year, we're proud to be running our first online Open. This tournament will differ from the regular in-person US Open in a couple of significant ways, but we hope it captures the same spirit of competition and camaraderie. This year's Open will be entirely online using the online Go server, or OGS. There will be fewer rounds, just four instead of the usual six. Playing time is reduced to one hour main time with five rounds of 30 second Yoyomi, down from one and a half hours main time. Rounds will take place only on the weekends, with one round on August 1st, two rounds on August 2nd, and one round on August 8th. We will be using AGA rules and McMahon pairing at handicap minus two. Importantly, this tournament will not be rated. You are playing for fun, glory, and of course, prizes. Prizes for winners in each band will include game reviews by professionals, free subscriptions to AI Sensei, and free subscriptions to Guo John's Internet Go School. Full tournament information can be found at the gocongress.org website. Pairs for each round will be posted to the US Open tournament page on that website at least one hour before the start of each round. These will be posted as soon as all results are in. TDs will be available by email as well as in the American Go Association group chat on OGS to make announcements and answer questions. Please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions. An important consideration for this online tournament is that once pairings are posted, players will be required to find their own opponents on OGS and create a game with them. Please visit the tournament page at usgocongress.org to check the specific settings that we are using. Thank you for your interest in the US Open. Good luck and have fun to everyone. Thanks, Dan. Keep in mind that the first game of the Open is actually happening at 4 o'clock Eastern Time. That is 1 o'clock Pacific. So very soon after this 
opening ceremony, you're going to have to go play your first game if you sign up for it already. So please do read those instructions carefully. As I mentioned, you can check out a longer version of Dan's video on YouTube. So of course, there's something else happening tonight, which should be also very exciting. Uh, also on OGS, uh, that's going to be the 9x9 tournament directed by Eric Wainwright. I know that Eric has been working very hard to bring this tournament into its virtual existence. So let's welcome him to speak a few words about that. Hello, I'm Eric Wainwright. I'm one of the organizers for tonight's 9x9 tournament. We have 240 players from around the world registered to play. And uh, the first round will start at 5 p.m. Pacific time and 8 p.m. Eastern time. And our job is to uh, make the tournament run as smoothly as possible so everyone can have a very enjoyable experience. This is a self-paired tournament and you will be using a shared pairing spreadsheet throughout the evening. A link to this spreadsheet will be available in the AGA group on OGS. Be sure to also download the OGS handbook and read it over before the tournament starts because it has a lot of useful information. We know that the first several rounds might take a little extra time to figure things out. So know that if you need any help, all of the tournament directors will be available through the OGS chat or the text messaging system. So we all hope you have a great time tonight and uh, maybe you'll make some new friends as well. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. I know that the nine tournament can be stressful for some people uh, during real life congresses because it happens right after the opening ceremony. So uh, some, some of you have had to check in and you might miss a few rounds, but actually, you know, this year you all get to play it from the comfort of home. So please enjoy that. These are not only two tournaments we have to offer during the week, of course. We recognize that some of you might be busy. Uh, you might not always have the entire day off. Of course, you may join our broadcast during the evenings, but if you're looking for something to do during the daytime, there's, of course, the Blitz Tournament, hosted by Yang Boli. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be running this year's Blitz Tournament online on the KGS Go server. Uh, we have 300 players, and we are going to be breaking everybody up into eight group sections every day for a quick three round tournament. What this means is that you will end up playing some people maybe twice in the tournament overall. So don't be surprised if that happens during the whole tournament. The tournament will consist of 12 rounds over four days. And this means that you will be playing some people more than once. Uh, what should also be interesting is that some of these games will be at different handicaps because there will be progressive rating change every day based on your performance. We hope this will provide you with some exciting challenges. And also, we're looking forward to see if anybody can win all 12 games because we're pretty sure that they might be our honorary AI for the tournament. I'm looking forward to having a spirited week of Go on the KGS Go server for the online U.S. Go Congress. One of the aspects of this tournament is it's going to be a blitz tournament. And this means that sometimes things are not going to be optimal. We need to have a positive attitude when we're playing in the tournament and recognize that some games will be lost, not because of our play, but because the environment in which we're playing. Registration for the blitz tournament will be open until Sunday night at 6 p.m. Everybody who registers will get a follow-up email after registration explaining in more detail how the tournament will work. And I look forward to helping everybody have a successful and fun experience in the Blitz tournament. Thanks, Jan. It's great to see a lot of double digit Q players joining us this year. That is, of course, 10Q to 30Q. And we have something for you there as well. This is also another tournament on KGS. And introducing that will be the tournament director, Bart Lepofsky. Hello, and welcome to the Double Digit Q Tournament, sponsored by the American Go Association, AGA, and it requires a membership in AGA. I'll be telling you a little bit more about that as we move along. So the Double Digit Q Tournament 
requires you to be there on time for both nights. We're going to start at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Daylight Time and 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Uh, we're going to do 30 minutes on a side for time and three bioyomis of 30 seconds each. If you need to contact me, I've put my couple of email contact addresses under my name there. So this is Bart Lepofsky, your tournament director. Prizes are going to be available, and they've been generously provided by Go Zhuan, whose internet Go School is well known, very famous. And if you get into first, second, or third place in your section, why, you'll enjoy her lessons enormously. This is what the go by the uh, KGS uh, client looks like. Now, I know that a lot of people in the tournament have been on KGS, but a lot of other people have been on OGS or other servers. This is the one you need to get. And if you don't have this, you need to get it. I hope you have a good time in the double digit Q tournament. So play well, enjoy your games and keep your groups all connected. <laughs> yeah yeah keeping your stones connected is pretty important trust me i've failed too many times when i was a beginner so let's talk about the later half of the week as well one of the tournaments that's really popular during the week in, in real life congress would be perigo so basically it's a very popular format invented in japan many decades ago and we actually have something like this every year i know i know you can't really sit next to your partner this year. However, we'll hope that you still enjoy this virtual tournament. Of course, this is also very new for us. We've never held large online Perigo tournaments like this, but I think I have faith because we have a very committed tournament director, Andrew Jang, who's here to tell you all about the format. Hello everyone, I'm Andrew Jung, and I'm the main tournament director of this year's Perigo event. Uh, assisting me will be Kevin Wong and uh, so in general, this tournament will be a lot more casual than the normal Perigo events that many people are used to, but I'm sure it'll be just as enjoyable. Hopefully it should remind you of Perigo. Uh, so starting off, I just wanted to remind everyone that the Perigo tournament takes place on Thursday, the 6th of August. Round one will start at 8 p.m. Eastern time, sharp, and round two will hopefully begin around 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, if the rounds take a little bit longer and you finish early uh, and your opponents uh, at your table have also finished early, you can begin your round two early. Uh, you can click this link here to access the full Ego Congress schedule. Next, this tournament will be split into tables. Each table will have four pairs based on pair points. Uh, the tournament style will be single elimination with consolation games. So the winning teams from the first round play each other in the second round and the losing teams from the first round play each other in the second round. The platform we'll be using is Pandanet. Uh, if you don't have Pandanet, please download and create an account as soon as possible. Um, you will be automatically added to a room called US Eco Congress Pergo Tournament if you have already have an account. Uh, most importantly, to use Pergo, uh, to play Pergo on Pandanet, you must have a desktop or a laptop. Pergo does not work well with uh, mobile devices. All right, that's it. Uh, thank you for participating in this year's Perigo tournament. If you have any more questions, feel free to contact me through email. That's awesome, Andrew. Thanks. Last but not least, let's talk about one of our newer formats this year. It's a brand new experiment. Normally, Relego would be played out in person, but of course, we cannot do that. So it's going to be a bit trickier, but hopefully, with the help of our two main tournament directors, one of the youth relay, Devin Fraze, and one of the adult relay, Audrey Wang. You've seen her before, of course. These two tournaments will come together very nicely. So yeah, Devin and Audrey, tell us more. Hey there, I'm Devin Fraze. Some of you may know me as the uh, youth coordinator at the uh, Go Congress, and this year I'll be uh, running the Relay Go, youth Relay Go. Um, Hopefully, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. That's our main goal. And I'll tell you about that right now. General format, you're going to have teams of five players, and it's going to automatically rotate players every five minutes, just like in a normal uh, relay race. 
um, you kind of pass the baton off to the next player and they go up to play. This will be a little bit different than the adult uh, Rio, which is going to be a Renko format. Um, this is just going to be one v one. So um, additionally, we'll have some breaks for you to uh, review and study with your team. Um, everybody gather together. And uh, the purpose of that is so you can strategize as you play against the other person. Um, something to know is you'll, uh, captains will be randomly selected on the teams to lead those reviews. Um, but everybody should have their own audio chat to be discussing uh, what's going on. Um, additionally, we'll be using AGA rules, uh, time setting of 60 minutes with five sets of 30 second Boyo Yomi. Those will be automatically set up for you on OGS. Uh, Komi is gonna be 7.5. Uh, you pass um, a stone at the end, um, and it's a point that count points as points, and white will pass last. Uh, generally, avoid cheating, so leave the team um, review when you're uh, playing the board, and don't use AI or anything like that. Awesome. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, feel free to reach out to me by email. That'll be available on the site, and if you have any um, other suggestions, please uh, reach out. Thank you so much, and can't wait to see you. Hi, Go players. My name is Audrey Wang. I am the tournament director for Team Relay Go. That will happen on Saturday, August the 8th. William Luff will be managing the tournament with me on that day as well. This is the first time that Relay Go is played online, and I'm hoping that this will be a blast for everyone, especially for people who haven't tried it before. I know a lot of people are probably wonder, wondering what Relay Go is. Honestly, I didn't really understand it myself until I started studying the rules from all kinds of sources. Um, Devin already gave a very good intro to Relay Go. Saturday Relay Go is a little different from Youth Relay Go as to the game flow. In the Saturday event, rotation will occur every 10 minutes for each team. Detailed rules should be sent to you already by now, and they should also be available on the Congress website. Feel free to email me if you have any questions. Um, on Saturday, we will have four games playing. That involves eight teams and about 100 players, 12 players on each team. All games will be played on a website that Devin Frey built for the love of Red Ego, and the team discussion will happen on Zoom. His website should make the process a lot easier and intuitive for everyone. The teams are assigned based on rank by me, so the teams playing are even in strengths. For the top board, our two coaches are Eric Louis, one professional, uh, one done professional, and Michael Chen, seven done. This game will be live streamed on Twitch and commented by Ming Wan Kim and Brendan Zhao. Board two to four are coached by Si Chen, Si Chen Jones, six done, and Michael Federa, five done. They will also assign a captain for each team in case they are too busy managing all three games at once. And this is my introduction for Relay Go. Hope to see you all on Saturday. All right, wonderful. So I hope that the introductions you've seen give you a good overview of what the tournaments are going to be like. If, and of course, if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to the tournament directors. And as I mentioned before, longer versions of the tournament tutorials will be available on YouTube. So of course, apart from the pro events and the tournaments, we have something planned here, right on this channel. This is, of course, my favorite department now because well, I'm actually running it. So doing my job, I guess. But uh, broadcasting has been putting in a lot of work this year. We actually have a very fantastic group of line producers will be helping us produce all the big commentaries you'll be looking forward to. Some of the stuff will be on the Twitch front page. So expect to see, I don't know, maybe a bit more viewership than usual. We've been inviting a lot of professional commentators, but this year, we're also very pleased to welcome a variety of new hosts. As you know, you may have seen Chris and myself on this channel here all the time, but every year during Congress, we would like to you know, maybe discover some new talent and maybe they will stick with us. So I'm really looking forward to producing behind the scenes this year and watching them host as well. If you do enjoy the content we put out, we're going to be here all week. So if you haven't seen this channel before, please consider giving us a follow. We we'll appreciate it. Now, of course, all the things we talked about are usually enjoyed by active Go players. But this year, we would also like to cater to our total beginners. We understand that actually lots of people haven't 
seen the game before. Actually, that's like 99% of everyone around us. So <laughs> not going to lie. This is pretty important. Uh, so this year, we're really committed to teaching beginners as well. We've actually put together a very good event uh, called the Beginner's Night on Tuesday. So that's going to be Tuesday evening starting at 8 p.m. There will actually be a Zoom workshop with David Kahn and Julie Baral, who've been working very hard on this. They're going to do a lot of teaching. So if you do want to bring your friends over who want to learn the game of Go, that would be a perfect timing to do that. And I think that this subject matter is very interesting for us Go players as well, you know, because if we want to have a larger circle of Go players, we got to teach better. So David actually had a lot to say about the subject, and I think it's all very valuable input. So let's give him a chance to talk about beginners and outreach. Good afternoon. My name is David Kahn, and I'd like to welcome you to the first US Ego Congress. It is wonderful that the AGA has been able to put together an exciting program of tournaments, lectures, game reviews, and other events without risking the health of the Go community. While most of you have been playing Go for many years and are committed to both playing the game and your personal path for self-improvement, I'm here to talk to you about beginners. I've been committed to Go outreach for many years, and I'm convinced that teaching more people how to play Go is important not only for the future of the game, but for our future. I'd like to explain why Go is so important to me and then how each of you can help in this effort if you are so moved. There are five key concepts that you learn when you play Go. Go isn't the only way to teach these concepts, but it is a fun and effective way. It is easy, even for a beginner, to see how these ideas are important. First of all, Facts matter. A Go position isn't alive just because we want it to be. A Go shape in the corner is demonstrably alive or dead, and our opinion on the subject is irrelevant. Go teaches us to see clearly and to learn to interpret correctly what we see. If we make an incorrect assumption about the status of our groups, a stronger opponent will often clarify the situation for us. When we first learn to play Go, we are often surprised by our opponent's moves. As we learn more about the game, we're able to consider likely responses to our moves so we can avoid moves that have responses we won't like. The more we learn, the further ahead we can read. There are joseki that we won't play if our opponent already has a ladder breaker in place. There is obviously a large amount of personal choice in a Go game. But to a surprising extent, the immediate future can be predicted. Another core Go principle is efficiency. We want to avoid wasted moves and we want our moves to work well together. Ideally, one move addresses several needs. Efficiency is important because both players have the same number of moves. If our first 50 moves are more efficient than our opponent's first 50 moves, we are likely to win. Balance is one of the most intriguing concepts in Go. Why wouldn't you just try to get as much territory as possible? Instead, it is important to aim for the appropriate balance between territory and influence, between attack and defense. Balance depends upon both our moves and our opponent's moves. We only need a half point advantage to win a game. An attempt to win by a landslide will usually result in a loss. Lastly, sneaky moves, hoping your opponent doesn't see what you're planning, often won't work against stronger players. It can be tempting to use these tricks to win against weaker players in handicap games, but this is the wrong way to think if you're trying to get stronger. You want to find a move that will work even if your opponent knows what you're thinking. These concepts aren't limited to Go. They are universally applicable. I find myself thinking in these terms as I read about responses to the COVID-19 pandemic or arguments for and against universal health care. Are people ignoring the facts or obvious consequences? Are they wasting time when urgent action is needed? Are people adopting polarized positions on nuanced topics ignoring the trade-offs inherent in their choices? 
are people misrepresenting their actual position in an attempt to sway public opinion? Are people trying to control outcomes by sharing only selected information that supports their position? These are all understandable temptations, but they are all practices that one learns to avoid through the study of Go. It is my hope that a successful Go outreach effort will improve the quality of discussion and decision-making in many areas. When I tell people that I'm trying to address the world's problems by teaching Go, a common reaction is skepticism. Isn't this problem insurmountable? Aren't there too many people who are making bad decisions in government, in businesses, and in communities? How could teaching Go possibly help? There are a couple of reasons why I remain hopeful, aside from a personal preference for a hopeful mindset. First of all, I see many issues decided by a very small majority. It is possible that a fairly small increase in rational thinking will be enough to sway some decisions in a more rational direction. We don't need to sway 25% of the people. A few percent may be enough. In addition, we are not alone. While we're out there teaching Go, there are abundant efforts to expand STEM education, which brings many of the same benefits. There are websites devoted to dissemination of reliable information and identifying false claims. It makes sense to add our voices to those who are already trying to bring reason and objective reality to discussion and decision-making. I believe that working together we can make a difference. In support of this effort, Julie Burrell and I have organized a beginner's night as part of this first EGO Congress, and this is a unique opportunity. While most people who have come to the in-person GO Congress in the past are already familiar with the game, the virtual format is conducive to beginners. The beginner's event is scheduled for Tuesday evening. We will be meeting on Zoom, and using OGS to demonstrate and play Go. Several of us in the Massachusetts Go Association have used these tools in recent months to teach Go to beginners, including kids, and it has been very effective. Why am I talking about a beginner's night in a virtual room full of people who already know how to play Go? Because I'm sure each of you know people who don't know how to play, some of whom may be intrigued by the game. The AGA will be doing some initial outreach specifically for this Congress event. Information about the Beginner's Night will be circulated by email and on social media. It would be helpful if you could keep an eye out for this information and pass it on to your friends, your coworkers, and anyone else, including kids who might be interested. Ask other members of your club to share it as well. Of course, this effort doesn't end with the U.S. EGO Congress. Across the country, there are many outreach efforts, some organized by or supported by the AGA and AGF, and some supported by local chapters. There are people of all ages who are looking for something fun and productive to do, and GO can meet the need. If you agree with what we're doing, look around and find an organization that you can help. Offer financial support if possible, and lend a hand where needed. As Stanford economist Paul Romer once stated, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Let's get out there and teach. Thank you. Thanks, David. We look forward to seeing you on Tuesday as well. I know that we've learned a lot of information here today, so please enjoy our games and don't feel overwhelmed. If you do have questions, please feel free to ask us by email or on social media or on the Go service. We're very happy to reach out to you there. So last but not least, this is the uh, really crucial segment of our opening ceremony. I think also the one we spend the most energy on. I think Audrey will agree with me. Uh, the opening keynote. Now normally, you know, during a real Congress, we would invite one of the speakers to give you know, maybe an hour long speech about their discovery of recent Go findings so far. But this year, we actually did a little bit better. We actually went ahead and invited a lot of guests. In fact, four very distinguished guests in the world of AI and Go. And I know that this is a very hot topic. And you know, for some of you, it always generates a lot of discussion. Obviously, 
the rise of AI in Go has significantly changed the way we look at a game. So the other day, we actually talked with Audrey and Devin, as well as four of our good friends. And we sat down for an hour and we chatted about the subject. We hope that you really enjoyed this program. I personally had a lot of fun producing it. So without further ado, here's, instead of the AI keynote, the AI roundtable. Welcome to the roundtable discussion on artificial intelligence and Go. My name is Audrey Wang, and I am one of the organizers of this year's Ego Congress. AI Go became the center of discussion in 2015 when AlphaGo, which is an artificial intelligence developed by Google's uh, DeepMind team, challenged and defeated Lee Sedow, one of the best players in the world and also a role model to many, over a widely publicized game, uh, five game match. I'm not sure how you all feel about what happened, but I believe that many Go players were devastated to see how Lee Sedow was defeated. During a recent interview, Lee Sedo was quoted saying, if I start, if I can start my life all over again, I might still play Go, but not professionally. AI Go has made me question the essence of Go. Professional Go players in old times, um, they study Go and invent something that only belong to th themselves. Now Go players play Go online to learn new things. This is a trend, but it's not the game that I used to play when I was a child anymore. Whatever your position on this matter, I think we can all agree um, that what has been happening in the Go world ever since is nothing short of revolutionary. Um, and here comes year 2020. Given what is going on in the world, everything is turning virtual. Um, our Go Congress, Go teaching events, and even some Go tournaments. This, of course, has created many new opportunities for AI Go around teaching, but it has also created challenges around the control of cheating in organized play. We hope um, it address many of these topics in our roundtable today. And, what, uh, and that these discussions offer some additional insight into the future of AI Go. Without further ado, I'm happy to introduce everyone in the meeting. Um, our first speaker is Lucas Baker. Uh, he is a former member of the DeepMind team that developed AlphaGo. He recently graduated from Harvard's uh, MBA program. Um, I've also heard that you are very involved with the uh, chess community these days. Um, si Chen Zhou, he is a good friend of mine. Um, is also, uh, is also a very strong goal player, I think. Uh, he just finished his uh, doctor degree in mathematics. And um, he recently wrote a paper that relates to Alpha Zero. Um, and he made a Go AI that's a uh, Naidan, Taijum Naidan. Um, uh, Andreas Howenstein is currently a self-employed software engineer in the Bay Area who, who is intimately familiar with the technical aspects of AI programming. Andreas also created a web server that hosts Katago, which is a great application for Go players who want to play with AI. And our fourth speaker is ha Jin Lee. She is a retired professional Go player of the Korean Baduk Association, who now is well known for her international promotion of Go. And she now lives in the Bay Area and uh, as a software engineer. She is very popular among Go players and has a very successful YouTube channel. And uh, she has a beginner Go app called Baduk Pop. Uh, let me also introduce the host of this event, Devin Frase. Devin is a very active Go player and currently serves on the AGA board. He will be the main host of uh, today's event. Now I am happy to turn the floor, to give the floor to Devin uh, to get this discussion started. Audrey, thanks so much for that intro. I'm really excited to be talking with everyone today. Thank you again also to all our participants for showing up. Um, 
Yeah, basically, you set the stage perfectly. We've gone from a world where it was thought that a computer playing Go would um, would come maybe 100 years from the future, and now we're, we're living it. And uh, so I wanted to go through and kind of walk us on that journey from the past to the present, and then uh, we'll all discuss what it'll be like in the future. Um, my first question is going to be for our guest, Lucas. And uh, Lucas, I was wondering, uh, since you were uh, one of the people working on the DeepMind team, um, Tell us what are those like? You know, uh, what was it? Um, was it what were things like as you uh, developed that breakthrough uh, program? Thanks, Devin. Well, uh, of course, being on the DeepMind AlphaGo team was an amazing experience. I think uh, one of the best parts was simply being privy to all the secrets. I mean, months before the paper goes out, knowing oh this thing beat Fan Hui, and then oh this thing has superhuman Elo, and I know who master is like that was uh, <laughs> that was possibly the most fun part of it all but it was also just uh, you know amazing getting to watch a piece of uh, piece of go history being written uh, one thing that really interests me uh, in retrospect is how alphago was part of the process of uh, i suppose what um, what some ai researchers call the bitter lesson uh, which is generally that uh, computation ends up beating cleverness. So I remember when, um, when AlphaGo was first released, there was a lot of elation, but also a lot of vitriol. I mean, I, uh, I had one person reach out to me by, uh, you know, by Facebook that to say F you, and that was spelled out. Um, but <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it, it was a very emotionally charged experience for everyone who's been devoted to the game of Go. And I think that was, partially because of confronting the, I don't know, the notion that maybe human wisdom isn't that special and that if it can be replicated by a machine, then as Lisa Dole says, what is the essence of Go? But the great irony is that it turned out to be, even in AI itself, human wisdom isn't that special. Since, um, since the 1970s, people have been trying to use two opposing approaches in AI, one based on largely human expertise um, or, or any sort of expert knowledge or heuristics that are explicitly thought of by people. And this was the original uh, approach in Go as well. And then when AlphaGo came along with uh, reinforcement learning and self-play, that turned out to be a more effective approach even for achieving those same heuristics that we might have programmed in beforehand. And uh, it turns out that that's, uh, you know, that applies across all of AI right now, um, search and learning in the sense of reinforcement learning or self-play are the main factors that scale infinitely. Um, they scale with computing power, they scale with architectural improvements, and we even got to experience that in our subsequent development of AlphaGo. Um, you may remember that uh, at some point AlphaGo had delusions, um, one of which was responsible for the loss against Lisa Dole in game four. and uh, in the process of in the process of investigating these delusions and trying to resolve them, we basically threw the whole book at it, like everything that we could think of between roughly uh, the aftermath of the match, so April 2016, and uh, maybe December of that year. So at least uh, seven, eight months of doing everything we could. And I was convinced at one point that Go-specific knowledge would be the key to resolving these. For example, knowing a local versus global positions or any number of other things that draws on the structure of the game itself. Well, what solved it? It turned out to be architectural innovations and adaptations that made it more effective, not only for Go, but in all the subsequent iterations as well, like Alpha, um, AlphaGo Zero, but also Alpha Zero and uh, Moo Zero, which is the one that generalizes even over the method of search itself. So it just kept getting more general and the solution always turned out to be not human cleverness based on specific knowledge of what we've done or learned in the past, but more general methods that could scale with their tools. And I'm not sure what I drew personally from that, but uh, I suppose, you know, reflecting on how it felt back then to see the debut of AlphaGo and how it feels now, I'd say that Perhaps these days we don't get too wrapped up in the search for profundity, but we realize that you know, something like Go can be sublime even if the skill to play it is not unique. 
Thank you. So I know you've moved on to other things, but um, I'd be curious what sort of opinion you have on how Go, uh, sorry, how AI is being used in the chess world. Yeah, I think it's very interesting to look at uh, how, not only how uh, Lilo Zero, et cetera, has been adapted to the chess world, but also how the, the chess world's prior experience with, uh, with computer play might serve as a model both for and against different approaches. Uh, for example, uh, the, the approach to cheating detection. Uh, it, chess has been superhuman on a phone since, uh, well, what, 2000, 2008, probably, 2009. And uh, in that time, chess players have uh, explored every sort of response to the problem. It's very hard to prove anything within one game. So you, um, I, I'm not a great chess player myself. Uh, I've just gotten a little more into it lately. But even uh, looking at the game report that comes after every game on chess.com, you can see, oh, well, you uh, got 98% um, match with the machine moves. And you, or you can have a game where you have you know, a 20% match. So on, the, on an individual basis, it's incredibly hard to distinguish. But uh, on a drawn out statistical basis, you can tell pretty well because not only can you, not only can you say, well, the statistical match is too high, but you can also, and this is, this is where the sort of centaur approach of human and AI together is really good. You can have an expert player with an AI look at the position and say, well, this, um, if you make this move, then it had to be with this move in mind. And that's a really deep and subtle idea that it would take a lot of, uh, it would take a lot of knowledge and a lot of thought to arrive at this. And instead, I don't know, you played a perfect end game in Blitz or something. So this, um, this integrated approach uh, has, I think, proven to be pretty effective. There are tons of uh, online tournaments going on now with, uh, with pretty effective cheating detection. I mean, it's, uh, it's gotten to the point where there's this uh, guy on YouTube who, who runs a climbing the rating ladder channel. And uh, I think he, he mused about whether one guy was cheating in one game. And uh, by two hours from that point, the account had been removed because then a review of the previous games had shown that not only was that game suspect, but all the other ones were as well. And I think that's, that's probably how, the, how things are going to develop in the Go world, where nobody is incriminated on the basis of one game and we're all innocent until proven guilty. But in the situations that matter, it's probably going to end up being very unambiguous. Um, and people will, of course, there's gonna be an arms race where people develop ever subtler approaches to cheating and ever subtler approaches to detection. But uh, that's, that's where I think the integrated approach is always going to be useful. Sichin, uh, I'd love to hear uh, from you now. So uh, what inspired your research into AI and your PhD paper? All right, thanks, Devin, for the question. So I think I was in a pretty unique situation all this when I was actually doing my PhD and uh, researching into uh, reinforcement learning, because I don't think I would have uh, had the chance to kind of implement this algorithm, play along, play around with it if I wasn't doing, uh, if I wasn't in grad school during the time. Um, so in fact, uh, so when I was working, uh, the, 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 main, the main thing with AlphaZero that I had was that I was using AlphaZero to try and attack a different problem in signals processing. Um, maybe some people may have heard of it, but it's in the field of uh, a field called compressed sensing. And um, because of how flexible AlphaZero's uh, algorithm is, you can really kind of apply it to any sort of like discrete action taking a discrete space, uh, a discrete space finite action problem through the, the Monte Carlo tree search. Um, so it was actually one of the first things that I had in uh, mind for the problem I was attacking because one, the, the problem I was working on, uh, there wasn't, the theory behind it was much more strict than the empirical results, meaning that the, the, there was a mismatch between what the theory said and what the empirical results say. So what I mean by that in specific detail is that Empirical results generally gave much more favorable results than what the theory is supposed to dictate. So this is where actually the, a lot of the, our, the reinforcement learning com, com, comes in because it's more of a, there, there's not many proofs in, in how reinforcement learning works. 
So uh, I was able to kind of, uh, uh, so that was kind of, kind of the motivation is that, is that Alpha Zero really fit in with the area that I was trying to work on. And, you know, it also helps that I'm a huge Go player. So I'm already biased in that fact, right? So it's one of the few first algorithms I would love to try. And even if it didn't work on my PhD thesis, I would have learned how the algorithm worked in and out. So it was a win-win situation for me in either case. Uh, now, in the end, the results did turn out to be good. Uh, and, and, you know, the paper that we wrote, it's currently through review. Um, so I'm very happy with that and everything. So everything turned out fine. Uh, now, uh, so yeah, so I think that, that that pretty sums up what I, uh, my process uh, with uh, my, my, my work uh, with uh, AlphaZero and, and the work uh, that I did in uh, compressed sensing and signals processing. And additionally, after that, I'd love to hear um, what your thoughts were as you watched history unfold with the AlphaGo and then AlphaZero um, AI programs play out. So I imagine my reaction is probably not too different from every other Go player out there. I'm not sure about all of you, but I stayed up pretty much the entire week to watch all of those games. I didn't report into work for like three or four days, uh, but this is graduate school, right? So nobody really cares if you're there or not. But uh, yeah, so uh, it's more, my, my reaction to, to, to the Alpha Zero Alpha Go, I think is more typical of what Go players experience and not from like a um, sort of like a graduate school or, or, or a graduate student perspective. Um, in fact, you know, I, I, I wasn't thinking about, uh, you know, um, my, my, my PhD work at all, or in, and it's like, none of that was important when, when the Alpha Zero and the Alpha Go came out. So yeah, so I, I stayed up and watched, uh, pr pretty typical. I'm sure everyone uh, stayed up and watched 24 uh, seven that entire week. Yeah. And I slept a lot afterwards, but. Uh, <laughs> Definitely, I know I did too. That makes, you know, I can relate there. Um, and well, you know, I'm look, looking forward to hearing more uh, from you how the future of Go is gonna progress as well when you get there. Thank you. Andreas, I know you come from a really interesting background and um, you're working on some cool projects. And so I'd love to hear from you about how Go is now accessible to the public and what sort of products are out there. And lastly, how people should be using them to study and get better um, and also potentially teach as well. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, so I think at this point, you know, it's no longer the question, can you get a program to play Go? I mean, it's essentially a solved problem because they're all so much stronger than the people are. And um, the question is, what, what are you going to do with it? Uh, and, and the first obvious thing that you think you want to do is I want to play against this thing and I want, uh, I want to uh, see how I'm doing. And uh, if you've tried that, it's really demoralizing because no matter how strong you are, um, it's just going to roll over you like a steamroller. And um, in the long run, it's not really fun. So then, then what else could you do? You know, and, uh, the first thing that, uh, uh, I, for example, tried, or many other people tried. You know, let's uh, let's uh, make these things weaker, and let's let's have artificial opponents that are somehow approachable and fun to play against. And I spent a lot of time doing that. You know, have just have a strength parameter somewhere in the code of of Lila Zero, where I can pass a parameter and say I want you to be uh, 10Q. And, uh, or I want you to be too on amateur. Um, and that's very interesting from a theoretical perspective, but uh, why would you want to play against a weak program? You know, there's no lack of weak opponents on the internet. And, and it's, just, it's just much more fun to beat humans. Uh, and, and the satisfaction of beating a program that was artificially, you know, lobotomized uh, isn't that great. Uh, I don't know. It's, so I kind of went off this idea. Uh, I know that uh, Hajin and Padukov are, did something very similar recently where, where they have different characters in the program that you can play and they have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, so after quite a long time, I, I went off this idea and I thought, and, and then also Katago came along and it can give large handicaps. So if you take enough handicap against that, you can actually learn something and, and the program shows you the truth, even if you win because of the handicap. 
the program shows you the truth. And I think that is the biggest contribution that AI makes is, is not uh, that you play against it. The big thing is that it, it really tells you what's going on. And it's also incredibly creative and, and beautiful while it does that. So, um, yeah, that's my 10 cents on that. And then there are different things you can do with AI. So one is to play against them. Another one is to analyze your game. Um, a third one is, um, you know, to learn and study with it. And maybe a fourth one is to watch pros go down against it, which is Si Chen's favorite thing. Um, and at the moment, people are trying to find out uh, what is really uh, the most, the best use of it. Uh, so after after doing the Lila Zero thing with the different characters that have different strengths, I did another website for Katago and where people take handicap and they can ask the program's opinion and that immediately had 10 times as many users. So you can see that uh, I think people are more into the tell me the truth thing than they are into I want to beat the computer thing. Um, other products that are out there is for example, AI Sensei, which is a website where you upload a game record and it shows you your biggest mistakes. You know, you just upload this letter run and says you went wrong here and here and here and here and here, which uh, I find very useful, but it's, it's mostly for serious players, right? You have to have a real interest in to improving your game and you have to be willing to study seriously. Um, I have a feeling that a lot of people um, are just wasting time in the office, you know, when nobody's watching. Um, that's another aspect is what are you want? Do you want to use a computer? Or do you want to use a phone or do you want to use a tablet? You know, uh, the things I did, I was thinking, I don't want the computer next to the go board. Go is such a simple game. You have uh, wood, you have slate and shell. And then I have a mouse, a keyboard, websites. You don't know where the sound comes from. And, and the computer next to the go board just turns me off. So I wanted to do something that looks good on a tablet. It's just as simple as the go board. It's just next to the go board. And you need no mouse. You just use your fingers, simple screen. But when I look at the user statistics, uh, people, more than half the people use computers. So I'm thinking, where might they be? And I, my guess is they're in an office somewhere, you know? Um, and uh, they're not at home at their beautiful go board focusing on anything. They're probably just sitting in their offices and, and, and you know, waiting, listening to some conference call that they're not interested in. Uh, yeah. Um, another aspect of all of these products is a, a lot of them need strong hardware. Right, and they need you to install something, which I think is a a huge barrier for people, for more people. Right, coming from a computer science background, like I come from a computer science background. Originally, I did speech recognition, um, and you you don't think it's a big deal to install something and to oh, I need a GPU. Well, let's just buy one. And for many people, especially uh, a lot of my Go playing friends, aren't all that young. It, anything that has to do with getting software, installing software, configuring software is a huge hurdle. And, uh, and people are putting all this incredible amount of work into these programs like Lizzie or Cotrain. Cotrain is easy to install, but still. Um, or, you know, Sabaki. And they're all wonderful programs, but if I talk to um, you know, 55 year old guy like myself, and I say, hey, just install Cotrain. They're like, Ew. and um, and you need a graphics card. What's a graphics card? Um, so I think the web uh, will probably be the future because you just want to take a phone or if it has to be your computer because you're in the office and use a browser and, uh, and play and not install anything. Uh, you know, it's tempting for a programmer to write a program, but it's not tempting for people to install any programs. It, it's just not something that they do. 
Um, I really another that. Uh, I'm sorry. I really appreciate you making that that you know the distinction, and then also basing that on. Uh, the data that you're collecting as far as usership and stuff like that. I mean, data de driven decision making is, uh, is, is key. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, what else thank you. you. Mm -hmm. um, so there's one product that I saw um, is actually a physical go board that they made in China. And you can put boards, uh, stones on it, and, and it detects where your move went and then the intersection is little LEDs and it tells you where the AI moves or it can tell you where you should move. So it's, it's like a web interface without a web interface. It's tactile, right? But the thing costs $800, I think is the price tag on it. And you get, you get a go board with a built in Leela or AI and, um, and you can play it physically. And I'm, so I think the verdict is out on that whether people are willing to buy that and at, at what price. I don't think Go players will spend $800 on, on an intelligent Go board. Um, has, have any of you heard of it or tried it? No, you haven't? I see. I, 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 was, I have I was, heard of it, but haven't used it. Haven't had a chance. Yeah. Yeah, Yun Yang San did a did a YouTube video where she unpacks it and starts playing against it, and of course loses on two stones because it's it's Leela or something. Um, yeah, but I like it. From the perspective <laughs> of a tournament organizer, um, game recording, just having something that automatically uploads to the web, people can follow along and pros can commentate right off it without having to do um, any sort of additional, um, you know, uh, additional people there recording, uh, as that can usually be a bottleneck. So. That's cool. Yeah, that's a better use for it, I think. Uh, but it's a different class also besides playing and uh, and analyzing, you know, it's like an intelligent go board, which is sort of what I tried to do then with uh, Kadagui. So it's not really thought meant or it wasn't meant to play against. It was meant as an intelligent go board, right? You can place your stone, you can upload SGFs, you can place your stones wherever you want. And then you just ask where is where are the good next moves? And then you can try to play around and you can say, oh, what if I go here and what are the good continuations? And while you're doing this, you see the winning percentage and also the score balance go up and down. So you can really explore in real time. And um, so currently that's my favorite way of using an AI. Obviously, otherwise I wouldn't have written it that way. Um, and I want to say, I'm not doing this for money. The nice thing is that I've completely given up on making money off of Go software. I'm doing this purely for fun. Um, and so I feel completely free to uh, do it the way I like. Uh, obviously, it's more, it's, you know, it's more a work of art and I do it, I'm doing it the way I like it uh, because uh, it's fun. But I, that, I mostly, I just take five stones against this thing. I, most of the times I lose actually even on five because it's so strong. And then I go through the game and I see exactly where do I lose how many points? What should I have done instead? I can, I can explore. And um, I end up doing this every day now. And, and that so far has been the most compelling way of using it. And, and playing against AIs competitively, uh, I think uh, it doesn't give me anything. And, playing against people and then uploading the game somewhere and having it analyzed and then looking at the analysis is feels like school, you know? Um, so I don't think that's going to be a lot of fun for a lot of beginners unless they're serious uh, minded people. Um, yeah, so uh, that's my take on too, it. That's, yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, and I, I wonder too, um, obviously it might have a higher use percentage um, and, I, and I'd be curious to see eventually over time how it affects the skill level of players. Um, uh, you know, even the ones that aren't using it in a study-esque type manner, but just to, um, you know, I know for beginners, one of the one of the greatest things you can do is just play a lot of games. And so if you have access to opponent any time that you can tweak and learn from, um, they can also teach you and review with you afterward. I mean, that can be a huge uh, learning tool. So yeah, yeah thank you for uh, talking about that. Hachin, of course, you hold a very unique perspective since you're a retired professional. Um, I'd love to hear how you've seen AI shaping the roles and identities of professionals and players, professional players in the modern Go world. 
Yeah, so let me start with this. So professional players are often referred to as one of two types, tournament players or teaching players. Tournament players are the ones who spend most of their time and energy training and competing in tournaments, and most of their income is tournament prize money. Teaching players may still compete in tournaments, but they have other economic activities such as commentating on TV, writing go books, running go schools, offering go lessons, and so on. In the case of Korea, there are about 380 professional players certified by the Korean Paddle Association, but only about 50 players can be considered tournament players. Last year, I looked up, the top player in Korea earned about 1 million US dollars from tournament alone, but the top 10th player earned about 120,000 US dollars. And then you can imagine it goes down. So the development of superhuman Go AI has impacted the professional Go world in many different ways. But today I want to just highlight kind of three areas, one that affects both types of players, one for tournament players and one for teaching players. So the first one is something kind of abstract, but fundamental. And also Audrey mentioned that in the intro and it affects all current and future professional players, I think. So the characteristic or identity of Go as a career or a life path has changed. When I was an aspiring pro, I lived at my Go Masters place with the Go Masters family and several other fellow students. Once in a while after dinner, my Go Master would call all his students to sit around the tea table in the living room and calmly make a pot of green tea. And he would follow all the proper rituals. And he would begin with some tips about the tea leaves or the tea table manners. And he would ask us how we are doing or we had any new thoughts about Go. So at the time, which is like, you know, not very long time ago, no one questioned that Go was a path you walk for a lifetime. Um, the life of a Go player was considered kind of similar to a philosopher or a scholar or a monk. So although there was a new movement already then trying to convince people that Go is actually a mind sport and Go players are more like elite athletes, but many Go players still harbored more like traditional values inside them. And the belief was that as a professional player, you explore and endeavor to reach an ever higher level of understanding. And the term divine move was used as a metaphor for an ultimate level of play. But now that we have an AI, we all realized that the best way to reach the highest level of Go is not through thinking about it for a lifetime. It's actually to buy more powerful GPUs or TPUs and have a well-trained deep neural network and have that AI ha uh, play Go for you. So suddenly there is this um, enormous sense of loss. So when AlphaGo defeated Isadol in the first match, even though I had already changed my career path, I still felt that loss inside me. And different pros are responding to it differently but many of them seem to be choosing to leave Go. So the case of in point is Isador, as Audrey mentioned, he retired at the end of last year. And I think she saw the same interview that I saw, it was on TV. And he described this loss of mission as a kind of major reason for his retirement. So that's the first thing. And the second important change I see is the professional players race to learn from AI. So when I visited Korea last December, I had a chance to catch up with a few of my pro friends. They told me that in the pro circuit, it's a unanimous belief that you need to play like an AI to win. And every serious player has an AI setup in their room. So now there are both up and downsides to this. The upside is that we sometimes see a player who was somewhat past his prime suddenly climb back to the top, having trained with AI more intensely. 
Also, there are a growing number of young and new pros who demonstrate surprising strength. This change gives hope to all pros who dream to be become number one one day, and also makes the competitions more interesting to fans as well. On the downside, however, the pro players seem to have lost the passion or motivation to develop their own styles. Before AI, most strong players had distinctive flavors of play, and oftentimes this style was the reason why some Go fans rooted for one player over the other. Today, like everyone is trying to imitate the AI style, and the pros judge each other only by who is better at playing like the AI. And that's becoming the only standard and the style. So the third change I want to highlight today um, affects teaching pros and it's a little sad for me. So it's the reduced demand for high level teaching games and private lessons. So when you have a professional title, you can command a high price for teaching games and private lessons. And this has been a critical source of income for many teaching pros. The user clients are parents of young students who are studying to become professional players. Usually how it works is that the headmaster of a good school would ask the parent of students if they want some additional training. And if the parents can afford this additional cost, which is quite high, <laughs> the go school would then go out to recruit a professional player who would agree to play a fixed number of games, like five games, one per week at a certain price. Then the pro comes to the go school, plays a teaching game with the student, reviews it with the student after. The private lessons are similar, students would pay a high price to get their games reviewed by a strong professional player. But today, as you all know, this type of high level lessons can be easily replaced by a strong AI. So of course there is still room for lower level classes and teaching, but pros are often better at playing these high level teaching games than like explaining big, uh, easy concepts to beginners. So very visibly, this resulted in many pros struggling to find a kind of new path for them, for their livelihood. So these were the major impacts of AI I see in the pro world, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, I, I want to add some comments to what Hajin just said. Um, it, it, it's really sad to, to hear what you had to say. Um, my, my, my father is a professional goal player and the same thing happened in China. I know a lot of professional goal players, they, they lost in their interest. And I know recently one goal player actually committed suicide. I don't, I don't know if it's related to mm. um, uh, AI, but I think there's something to do with it. So what do you guys see as um, the opportunity for the goal community in the future? Do you think this is the demise of Go? Um, I would, I would imagine this is more of transitional period where we actually, we actually move to mind sport. Finally, we've been talking about it for decades now, but many people still believe that Go was more of a art and philosophy before. But now with the AI and all, I think we will make an actual. <laughs> transition to the sport world where it's like more considered like a form of sport. Actually, on, on the topic of uh, sport, I'd be interested to know if you think that uh, coaching might appear as a role. You mentioned uh, there are tournament pros and teaching pros, but uh, there's also a precedent, not so much in the Go world, but uh, to have coaches who prepare the book for strong players and maybe help them uh, get the psychological approach right and figure out how to um, best optimize given AI preparation and all the tools available for any given game. Yeah, so actually it's already in practice in Korea. So it's not very known outside, but inside the KBA, I think it's been probably about five, three to five years when Korean players started losing more to Chinese players, the KBA started a kind of the training team for their top pros. 
and they had like other like used to be top but not anymore pros as a coaches and then they would give feedback and then like help them with like kind of mentor training <laughs> and then study materials etc so yeah i think we are definitely heading towards to that direction yeah, one thing I, I wanted to add really quickly is that even at the very strong amateur level, I have a lot of uh, very strong amateur friends that kind of echo the kinds of feelings that that professional players are feeling. Um, there's a lot of actually retired Go players in the Bay Area that are really, really strong uh, who actually kind of, um, they, they, they quit because of AlphaGo. And the reason being is mm -hmm. that Go used to have this kind of like a, like a magic to it, right? Because you don't know what's exactly correct and what's not. So you can be very uh, inventive, I, I guess, is the, is the best word with it. But now there's this program that says, okay, you should go here. You, this is better than, you know, if you play here, I'll go here and then you'll lose. And it's very, very hard <laughs> to kind of understand why sometimes <laughs> using AI to even why you lose. I, I can give an example. Um, sometimes when a very strong player plays against the AI, you just see your percentage gradually start to lose, right? It's not usually a single move that kills you. It's just that every move somehow still has, every move gives you a very slight percentage decrease. So it's very, very hard to evaluate for at the very strong amateur level what's going on in your game. Because it's at that level, it's very, very subtle. It's not one mistake that just kills you. So uh, at least that's my experience and some of my friends' uh, very, uh, experience as well. Uh, we Often we go online and then you know, we, we go on a Zoom session and we just have them play against the computer. And the computer can easily give us four handicap. Three is very, very hard to defeat for Kadago. Very hard to defeat. Um, so, but it, it's, it's, when we play them even, it's, it, it, you get this feeling is that it's, it's very, very hard to actually learn from it if you don't spend an enormous amount of time trying to uh, uh, understand what's going on. Well, in yeah. regards to sports, too, um, we talked a bit about uh, AI cheating, I think, before the camera started rolling. Uh, and I'd be curious to hear about, you know, uh, your thoughts, what you guys' thoughts on that, too. Uh, I'll begin really quick. So I have had some experience in New York and around here doing some cheating work post this AlphaGo craze. Uh, and now that Alpha, before Alpha Zero, you know, you didn't, you had no type of, like, uh, you had no suspicion that someone was going to cheat, right? It's just like inconceivable. I mean, th there would be no way for you to actually do it. Um, but after AlphaGo comes out, I became a bit paranoid, I'll be honest. Like definitely more paranoid. For example, uh, when I was uh, helping, uh, working with David um, at the New York, uh, New, York, uh, New York Gotham Go tournament, we were saying, oh, that guy brought a phone, right? He's looking at his phone all the time. What's going on over there? You're much more suspicious. Like um, it's sometimes very hard to catch them in the act. But what do you do when you you highly suspect that they are cheating? Do you call them out on it? Do you throw them out of the tournament? It's it's I'm not I'm not really entirely sure what you would do uh, uh, under this scenario. <laughs> there was a case in Europe where there was an online European international match, and uh, somebody analyzed. Uh, somebody analyzed the games, the, uh, the places were made, and they found out that this one guy had a 70% match with Lila moves or with the top two Lila moves. And then they said, you must have been cheating, right? Uh, and he's just said, no, I'm, I'm training with Lila all day. Uh, and that's how I got so strong. And it's not, uh, it was not professional level. You know, these people are like strong, strong amateurs. Um, and eventually the decision had to be rescinded because they said 70% is not proof. I just wanted to mention, throw that in. So it has happened and they have the same, same problem. Yeah, I've, I've actually played that guy a few times in uh, European tournaments. Um, but on the, on the subject of uh, cheating, I think one interesting wrinkle is the difference between perhaps uh, like what you need in order for a, a weak player to cheat and a strong player to cheat. For a weak player to cheat, um, the detection and counter would be mostly statistical. You could say, okay, you have an 85% match or a 90% match. There's, there's some match rate over a certain number of games to Leela or any other strong AI that 
would just become too suspicious, especially if you knew that for certain moves, like how would you ever come up with that move otherwise? But um, I, there's, there's a possibility that stronger players could develop more sophisticated methods of cheating and there would be an arms race in order to catch them. Uh, I remember reading about uh, in chess once, Gary Kasparov said, in a, uh, he was the strongest chess player, um, and he said in a game against a, you know, a world champion, he would have only needed one bit of information in order to win now in order the, the, the time to start his attack in that game. And uh, if there's, there's a video online of how somebody as a sort of white hat hacker did this for, for chess and uh, used an ear implant plus just a, a few bits of information to win a game against a world-class player. So I think that uh, you know, in, in tournaments in general, the detection method might end up being pretty straightforward after a year or two. But uh, at the top level, I think it's going to remain quite difficult for years to come. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Because uh, I, I guess like at the very top level, you only need a couple of moves to really tip the game in your favor, right? It's, uh, so you don't have to follow A for that. You just have to be better than your opponent. And uh, there are some critical junctions in a Go game that really determine this. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough to solve. And I'm not sure uh, for in the online case what would happen. For example, you know, I, I, like, uh, service, service, different servers have different approaches. Currently, uh, as I had mentioned before, Taijem, I think, has kind of given up on this. They allow AIs. I asked the moderators before, and they were fine with it. But they did say you have to like, kind of announce to your opponent. Um, but I, I presume that, that that stuff all has to change in the future. Um, they probably, yeah. Um, I, I just want to chime in for this year's Ego Congress. Um, we have a fair game committee. Um, so if you suspect your opponent's cheating, you can report. So we, we don't have, uh, we don't offer cash prizes this Go Congress. So I, I hope it doesn't give people any incentives to cheat. But I know like people, they, they're competitive, they, they, they want to win, but please don't cheat. <laughs> That's all I want to say. Um, well, and of course, that can't be the solution for the future, you know, all tournaments in the future, but that's a, obviously going to be, I think, one now. I think the risk of cheating would be fairly low in this, in this year's Congress. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, think, I, I actually have a really positive uh, view of AI in, in the way that um, I, it does have negative effects. We, we can't ignore that. Um, but hopefully, I, I think it could be a tool that makes Go a wider, more widely popular game in the West. Um, which currently it is not. Um, I don't know if you guys have thoughts on that, uh, seeing how it might spread it, but I'd love to hear those. So, you know, whenever I visit my parent-in-law, my father-in-law is a big golf fan, and then he's watching golf tenor all the time. And I don't know anything about golf, but it's actually kind of interesting to watch it with him because the golf broadcasting, they use a lot of technology. They use like computer graphics and then like the simulations and et cetera. So I was hoping that one day Go would have those like tools, very advanced tools that can make the live broadcasting a lot more interesting. And I think now the question is who would develop it? Like who has the money to develop it? So we have some sponsors who like sponsor major tournaments but they actually come with like a skeleton budget where you have the prize money and the fixed cost for running it. And the associations, they are also very tight. Many of them are like volunteers not getting paid. So like I was hoping, you know, in the Go community, we have a lot of like developers who <laughs> have passion for the game. So I just wanted to say here that like, if you're interested in like hobby products, like as a community, like this would be something we can really benefit the Go community and the Go world, the pro players. So um, I was actually approached by a chess grandmaster who, who wanted to make sports betting on chess a thing in the US because I think the legal situation is changing. It's becoming more legal in more states uh, right now, or at least that's what he said. And he, he thought that sports betting on board games like chess uh, or by proxy Go would be more interesting because you have an AI, because the AI can actually give you a numerical uh, 
a, a number about the position, which you know you can do in baseball and golf and other sports, but not in chess or go. But now you could do things like uh, there's only one move and all other moves are bad, and you can bet on whether he'll find the one move. Or, you know, you can find the critical uh, points in the game and, and let people bet them. Or um, uh, you, you, you can bet on do they find the right moves or other such things, you know. And, and you, can, you can mix this with information about the players. So maybe you can actually have an AI learn something about players probable blunders and uh you can bet on will he make his usual blunder and all kinds of ideas like that and i think it would be feasible with go uh especially in countries where it's you know popular and people like to bet a lot like china and korea i think are friends of betting um so i could see how that would be a way for the baduk and weichi world to uh create income have you, any of you guys ever seen uh, uh, Gels Marble Racing? It's basically uh, some YouTube channel where somebody uh, has teams of marbles uh, and literal stands filled with marbles just watching the matches. And the, the whole event is hypnotizing to watch. It, it feels very much like watching real sporting events, uh, which makes me realize that maybe the athleticism of the players isn't uh, one of the primary viewing joys of, of watching sports. It's also the the layers of statistical analysis on the teams and how they've competed in the past and, you know, all those additional layers, which I think, you know, AI can add and, and also get potential gambling can add if that's a legal uh, venue as well. And, and um, you know, the, yeah, the, the, yeah, it's, it, it's blown my mind. Um, so I wanted to drop that in. Sorry. <laughs> Marble. Yeah, one question to ask might be, who's the who's the Nate Silver of Go? <laughs> I like it. A little context for maybe anyone who doesn't know about Nate Silver. Oh, uh, yeah, founder of Five Thirty Eight, uh, basically professional not only statistician but uh, predictive analyst of uh, all types. So he's done politics, he's done sports. Uh, very very active blog. It's now a whole company. One thing I uh, anecdotally noticed is that, uh, at least from my basically frequenting of like Go clubs, that there's a lot more newcomers that learn about the game through uh, the AI. Um, so I think it has this effect where a lot of the very strong amateurs, I wouldn't say a lot, just the people that I know, um, they are more demoralized at the higher levels, but it does introduce like a lot of newer people to come into the game. And as Hajin said, this may be the transition, right? where you know these strong players are like okay i've had enough of it but then these new players come and then maybe they'll become really really strong um looking back right if i had to go back and relearn go and if there was the ai i would just learn from the ai right i would just uh and then maybe i wouldn't have this feeling of maybe oh, okay i've used this way to used all this time to with go teachers and uh, learn go this way where I could have just, you know, used the AI to kind of train me. There's a, I've had, um, there's this sort of lost like opportunity cost sort of feeling where like, oh man, I've been learning Go all wrong, right? I've, I could just learn from the AI from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I, here's, I have another aspect as to how AI influences popularity. Uh, a friend of mine owns a web store for Go equipment in Germany. I think they're the biggest uh, provider of Go equipment in Europe. And usually, you know, they used to sell a lot of books, uh, which of course now nobody's interested in anymore. Um, uh, but they sell a lot of stones and boards. So that's their main business now. And they had their best month ever immediately after the Isidol match. And I talked to him on the phone recently and he says they have the seventh consecutive record month of Go equipment sales right now. So they, oh. for the last seven months, it, the Go equipment sales for them have been, have been going up and they're ecstatic. I mean, they're probably the only people in the Western world that I know that can actually make a living off of this game uh, just by sales, selling boards and stones and it, business is, is going crazy. Uh, and I think it must have something to do with AI because what else changed, you know? 
So this is something funny. One <laughs> of my think friends. Of one thing that oh, changed. Yeah. <laughs> what else changed? The pandemic. Yeah. Oh, the pandemic. <laughs> oh, it's not been going on for seven months, has it? I'm losing track of time. Yeah, not to make you demoralized, uh, Andreas, but one of my friends did buy GoBoard and, and Stones, and he didn't know how to play it, but he also bought a GPU to tr to play, uh, to cheat with, basically, online. So, oh, okay. so <laughs> I'm not insinuating that all those people who bought GoBoards <laughs> also bought GPUs, but uh, it, it made me laugh when you kind of said that. I, I should tell my friend to put, have GPUs in his store next to the Stones. <laughs> <laughs> You might as well just advertise your uh, your Go app there. It's like, oh, you know, by the way, you can also use this and, you know, use it on this Go server. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, any final remarks? Maybe we should just, like, go around the room. Um, Andreas, you're up first. Um, yeah, I, I have to say that it's kind of sad to see how, how the AI affects the pros and, and the whole philosophy part of the game so much. I mean, for me, it's, I, I come from the other end, like I'm, a, I'm in computer science. And, uh, you know, I, I wrote, I, back in 1990, I tried to write a term paper about how you could train a neural network all by itself to play the game of Go without knowing anything about it which was, of course, a no-go. You know, I wasn't a good programmer. I didn't know a lot about Go, and the hardware wasn't there either. So it totally flopped, and I gave up on it. But I was very excited when suddenly in 2016, they said, oh, they did it, you know? Uh, so it, it was kind of a personal experience because they did the exact same thing that I dreamed up 30 years earlier and, and of course, wasn't able to do at all. I think it was presumptuous to even think about it, it looking back. Um, so to me, it was very exciting. Uh, yeah. Um, si Chan? Uh, so in general, I think I have a more melancholic tone, um, but I'm also pretty uh, optimistic in that uh, it has basically further really intensified my interest in like reinforcement learning and all in these areas. So actively these days, I've been more doing uh, uh, working with my old collaborators again on uh, more uh, uh, on more new stuff in this area. Uh, you know, when it comes to Go, it's uh, I definitely have that kind of feeling, which I reiterate is that um, there's a little bit of magic spark that's gone missing. But you know, it's kind of been replaced with this intense interest for for AI and uh, this optimistic view for how AI will play out in the future. So uh, I guess yeah, I guess it's an overall. I would say it's an overall good for me. Ajahn, any final thoughts? Yeah, so <laughs> as Sitchan said, it's, it's kind of mixed, but I do see an opportunity for Go to become more entertaining and interesting for observers. And I believe that's where the most of the opportunity lies for the future of Go. And maybe also, to be able to teach people more effectively and then like lead them to a higher level like sooner. That could be another area. So yeah, I hope like we were able to inspire some of the viewers <laughs> to look into more into that. And I want to thank the organizers of this round table and also the Ego Congress. I'm really looking forward to playing the open I am playing the City League final and Pergo. <laughs> so I'll be quite busy. And I hope my boss doesn't notice that I'm kind of distracted <laughs> because I'll be also working at the same time. But yeah, huge thanks. And yeah, it was interesting talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for promoting us. Um, Lucas, you're next. I don't think I could wrap it up any better than that. Genius. <laughs> you don't have to. Thank you, Lucas, for coming out. And thank you, everyone. And thanks for the, the appreciation, Ajahn. Um, so that'll be the end of our uh, roundtable. And um, look forward to potentially seeing uh, some of you guys at the Ego Congress. Bye. Bye-bye.
All right, that's all we've got for the opening ceremony this year. We hope that you enjoyed it. I don't know how many of you are still around. Um, certainly, for us, it's a tremendous opportunity to get to know all of you virtually this year. So please stick around and let's stay in touch throughout the week. Actually, tomorrow we'll be streaming some more on this channel because we'll begin with AGF Teacher of the Year, Frank Luo, who's set to speak on Sunday, that is tomorrow, at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. And after that, we actually are going to have a couple of lectures. So the live action starts tomorrow. Don't miss it on Twitch. And other than that, enjoy your games. I hope you see you around. Bye for now.